So Anna went over it, I think, from I think the institutional implementing partner perspective. And I'm going to go a little bit from the USG perspective on why we begin with you know, the definition of an NGO. And that term came from the US, from the United Nations and re refers to an organization that's not part of a, go a government and it's generally not for profit. Um, you know, and again, she sort of noted on there's a distinction. What we're talking about are really about working with African-based NGOs and not U.S.-based NGOs. And in Africa, they're not usually called NGOs; they're called CSOs. And um, again, she sort of touched on it, but there's different levels. Uh, the CSOs often, and the ones we end up working with, there's the formal ones. They're registered. They have a structure. They have a management board. They have, you know, a, a budget. Things like that. And then you have ones, and, and each government has different uh, regs around how they're registered. And then each government also has a different relationship. Some of them are very supportive of some of them make it very difficult. Sometimes they change the rules sort of midstream very cleverly about, you know, and then there's rules around who gets foreign funding. So each country is a little specific. Um, the other thing is that there's a lot of them, and, you're, and so there's a difference with uh, what are informal groups, and again, she touched on it, but there's things like community associations, women's associations, and in Niger, there's something called FADA, which are these youth groups that are around sort of, they used to say like they liked a certain, um, almost like a, a fan club type of thing. There might be listening clubs. So there's lots of different ones you have to understand the level that you're looking at. Um, even the formal ones can be, they're organized again, I would say in different ways. There's some around service provision, so they might be around, you know, typical ones that you think of orphanages, working with, I don't know, kids after school, things like that, sort of youth ones. There's economic associations. She had a picture of them, the Association of Herders in, uh, in Chad. Um, there's also the Sahel, that's more of a phenomenon actually in the Sahel, where there's an association of women who sell tea in the market, seriously. Um, and then there's advocacy ones, and that's the ones that I think get a lot of the limelight and certainly a lot of the ones that governments are nervous about, and they're advocacy ones that might be agitating for, uh, like Watchdog, like Transparency International, which is a multinational one that has branches in, in um, each many countries. Or there was one I worked with in Zimbabwe called WOZA, which was Women Arise, something of that very sort of agitating against the government. They got thrown into jail a lot. Um, so there's a distinction, and a lot of these governments, when you say civil society, they get all nervous because they think of the ones that are adversarial to the government. And so they have, you know, they, they, there's a, and in the area of security, there is sort of that line between who's providing services, let's say, that they feel comfortable with, and who's providing messaging or getting in areas of what they would consider government, inherently government policy. So that can make it a little uh, confusing. The other thing is that NGOs or CSOs, associations, are relatively new in most sub-Saharan countries. Again, up until the early 90s, there were no laws for this to even exist. Okay, And the few that they were there, again, I worked for many years in Zaire, now the DRC, it was illegal. Civil society, non-government organizations were illegal. And the only ones that were allowed tended to be affiliated with religious institutions. And so the idea that it came out of a Catholic church or even, I think, a Muslim you know, organization, that that was allowed. So this is relatively new, 20 years, maybe 30 years in some countries. And, and often they had what they call briefcase NGOs. So then the government said, OK, you can register. They register. And, and like in Mali in the early 90s, they actually used it as a way to deal with excess graduates. So they had no jobs for graduates. They made it really easy there for them to register so then they can try to get money from donors. So you know the, the point is, is that each country is a little different, and to, the track record of a group is important. So you know, using, working with people, if it's at the embassy or local partners that have a sense or there might be a registry of NGOs or a ministry of planning sometimes, like in Chad and other countries. So there's a way to try to get some of the situational awareness, to use that term, of what's going on, because it can be confusing. And they can come up and do a great speech and sound really capable, and it's that charismatic person, and there's no one behind them. Um, the other sort of distinction is national, regional, and local. So the national ones, based in the capital often, they may have some operations outside in different parts of the country, tend to have more access to training and education and other sorts of things, so they're a bit more sophisticated. When you get down to a, 
um, uh, regional capital. You might have some there, you might not. You certainly run into language issues. And then when you get further down to a community, often, again, their capabilities are much, much less. Um, so I'm going to take, again, a different perspective about why we work with them. And, um, you know, the reach or access, I mean, there's a reason about it. One, in many of the security environments, again, using the Sahel, but in other parts, there's just geographic distance, you know, uh, northern Ch Chad, Fada, you're not going to go running up there very much. But also, we can't go there. Okay, we may have northern Mali, we can't go to northern Mali. We have very limited access time constraints for a lot of places. So the access is an access because of physically, but also security wise. The other thing is sort of they understand the terrain. So even if there's security issues, obviously in local NGO, both they won't be as much of a, a target, but also they understand, they know the clues to really in, um, in, in Eastern Congo, troop movements. They knew when someone was moving or not, so whether it was safe for them to go in or not. And they're also, um, the other reason I'm talking about is that our mandate, our goal, particularly with USA, but in general, is to transfer the information. So you're building capacity, you want to leave them behind. You work through the NGOs, that's an automatic, it should be an automatic part of all that happens, or CSOs. The other thing is building partnerships. You know, we talked about the program, the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership. It used to be called the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Initiative, they changed it just to highlight the idea of partnerships. And, you know, you need to have, so using, working through local organizations is obviously a great way to build those partnerships. Um, they're also bringing knowledge back to you, again, using the idea of situational awareness. In insecure environments, those local organizations are going to be your eyes and ears to tell you if it's safe to go, what's going on, what's happening. Um, they need it because they can't do their job and stay safe. They're your source for that information. We're required. USAID, we have something called USAID Forward, which, and it's a target of doing up to 30%, I think, of our business, direct, you know, sort of going away from our US partners and going directly to um, NGOs that are based in those countries. So we actually have a mandate in USA to try to shift the resources into those countries instead of paying, frankly, Americans or other foreigners to go do this work. Um, sometimes it's cheaper to use a local NGO. It kind of depends. One other thing that we haven't talked about is you also use them for information gathering formally. Oftentimes there's polling, there's, um, you know, focus groups, there's ways that you do to gather intel and our version of it. And so you have to use local groups. There's language issues, there's trust issues, other things. So there's actually a lot of work besides delivering of services or advocating or training that are an important use for local NGOs. Um, and uh, so I, I think one of the other things is, um, you know, what type of activities we do. You know, so we wanted to talk about for CVE and I, and, and I guess other ones, what kind of programs. And, she, and again, Anna touched on a lot of them, but for youth, you're working with, um, more broadly, the idea is to give youth something to do and give them status in the community. I mean, that's sort of the short end. That's what we use this term youth engagement, because often they'll say, well, we want to give them jobs. You know, and I'm a really actually a very logical person, and when I started doing these programs, we had no formal framework on how to design countering extremism programs using development assistance or what the role of development assistance. And everyone says, well, it's because youth need jobs. And I said, well, and they're poor. I said, well, we've been, you know, USAID had like 50th anniversary in Mali a couple of years ago and things like that. Obviously, youth, we haven't figured the poverty issue. We haven't figured the jobs issue. We haven't figured the education issue. I'm not going to go in and figure it out because of counter-extremism or counter-terrorism. So you have to be a little smarter about it. And it's really more about, you know, you're not going to fix the economy, but it really is about youth having something to do and having status. I can't say that enough, that they feel like they have no voice in their community, they have no role, and they're not respected. And so there's a lot of things you do. Yes, you need some training. That's You have to do some, what I call some tangible benefits or development gains. But a lot of it is really about community, the youth having a voice. So there could be the sports clubs, there could be debates, there could be community centers, it could be youth doing activities in the community, small projects, cleaning up the streets. You know, a lot of these things are what's done with these programs. There is also civic education with that, and that's typical programs. Um, the other part, though, on the flip side, is you have to work with the local government. You know, um, 
years ago when I was doing some work in Nigeria, when there was the change and there had been a lot of work with NGOs because the government was in the botch and we didn't deal with them. When they had a change in democratization, the money for NGOs sort of dropped off the table and they were really upset. And we said, well, we have to train the government because they don't know how to work with you. We have to give them some capabilities. You're demanding things from them. You're demanding performance. They need some help too. Particularly at the community level, the work with the local government is a part of what we do. And I think that's a point of where you're working with, if you just work with civil society and, or NGOs or CSOs and don't work with the gov local governments, it's only half of the equation. Um, other things you do, there's cultural events. A lot of the activities are around reinforcing uh, the national culture that in, in, um, is considered moderate and tolerant. So because often some of the uh, more restrictive practices that are coming into some uh, countries in the Sahel Say, you know, um, something like the idea of marabous in the, in the Sahelian countries, which is their version of kind of saints, are not in the Quran. Um, you know, dancing, poetry contests, things like that, you know, traditional dance, that, that's, that's against their practices. And so this is just a way of reinforcing it because it's a way to connect in sort of national pride in a good way. And that's been a typical thing. A big part is media and messaging. So again, you have to work with local NGOs because you don't know the language, which is often well below French. You don't have the right person to be able to send that message to someone, the people you want to hear. You need someone who resonates with it. Um, and also, they're going to come up with the right ideas of, of what really needs to be said. Um, one other type of activity, which is sort of a um, very important, but not necessarily directly CV, is working with, and it was mentioned, I think, in one of the previous panels, um, sort of these um, uh, early warning groups. And so working with something called WANEP is a program. It's not CV, but it's worked with um, out of the West Africa Regional Mission. And they're the West African um, network for um, early warning or something like that, something. But it's NGOs that are looking at um, conditions and, and, and uh, is there a conflict that's coming up. And it actually came out of the um, Liberia-Sierra Leone uh, conflicts. Um, EGAD is also another, we work with them as a multilateral organization, so I, I think that's another important part of what we do. Yeah? What's that, um, Intergovernmental Authority on Development. There you go. Yeah. It's, a, it's an East Africa one. Uh, so, so now I'm going to just take a few minutes on the mechanics, because again, one of these things is also very nice and, and, and good, but um, you know, U.S. government, we end up working sort of indirectly. Okay, see, Anna was like the person who actually worked the NGOs. There are, we can do, we do, and we're trying to do more direct grants, but if you're doing a direct grant, we have FAR regulations about how we manage our money, uh, there's other issues, so it's actually the bigger national NGOs that you're lucky that you're going to work with mostly. Also, it tends to be more one-off grants, you know, one project than like a multi-year activity with, uh, if you're doing it directly with an NGO. That being said, we do have a relationship with some of these bigger ones that are, like in, in Niger, there's a youth one called Garkua and Kala Kala, and you can direct, have that relationship. Um, the other thing in working with them, I just want to make sure you're transparent. Okay, if you're doing something related to security, you're related to CVE, you know, don't, don't, don't hide what you're doing, but use the locals as your guide of how you frame it, how you describe it. But people aren't stupid. If I showed up in, you know, um, Nuwadibu in Mauritania saying we're going to try to do some work, they want to know, like, why the heck are you paying attention to us now? Okay? So don't insult their intelligence. So don't give them, give them a good discussion and, and have it as much as you can. You need to be transparent of your intention and purpose. Um, very briefly, they wanted me to talk about, and I'm going to not give the short shift, but I don't, I don't really know this too well because I'm a little old for you know new technology like SMS and cell phones in the field. So I do use them, but I, you know just to touch on it, they are using it in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's a big difference in different countries. Cell phones are everywhere. You all know this. Um, internet, not so much. Nigeria is the one that has a lot of it, and Kenya and you know the Horn of Africa to a certain extent. They are using it though. Um, SMS is used very importantly for messaging and, and also for call-in shows with radio. Um, 
smartphones and data a little a little less, but in, in particularly in East Africa, Facebook is very big for both exchanging, creating networks, and getting information out. The other thing is money transferring. That's sort of growing, but that was always there. They actually were doing this in Nigeria, like I think in almost 20 years ago. So the money transfer part is actually important about moving money and resources. And again, that's the mechanics of being able to work with groups remotely. So that's been very helpful. Last thing, and we can follow up on this, is some of the challenges. Um, we tend to overwhelm the few capable organizations. She talked about the darlings. I would say just the ones that people are familiar with. They tend to get, you know, not only us. Then you get the the EU, the you know the the French, the you know UN. They all start going like there's three groups. Example, there's a group. I think it was ASS, a triple S in Timbuktu. They do polling and have access. They were the only group. Everyone used them for everything. Um, they were really good. They had like a couple hundred people, but you know, at some point it kind of overdoes it. Oversight. You do this, we have our own regulations. It's still taxpayer money. How do you do it? You know, and you're doing oversight for, for technical, technical verification, i.e. corruption and graft. Um, you're also doing it to get, make sure there's not unintended consequences of the activity. Uh, you know, are you being seen as favoring one ethnic group over another by working with this one? Is what they're doing, did they misunderstand the purpose and now they're doing something completely counterproductive and uh, it's not really what you wanted? So you need to sort of see what's happening. Um, and you have to do this often remotely, so that's another challenge. The other thing is the learning curve. You know, again, if you want to get beyond the usual suspects, you've got to spend some time sort of almost working side by side with them or mentoring. Um, the scaling up is very difficult. They could be great in one town and you want to get them to the more remote area or just a different ethnic group. They don't have those capabilities. Trying to link organizations, again, th actually that's not so hard. They tend to like to do NGO associations. They have platforms or umbrella organizations. That one they're actually okay with. Um, sort of the, the one last point on a challenge. In my area of working with countering violent extremism, it's not their top 10 problem. So actually what we're doing is doing their traditional work for the most part in an area that we've targeted with an intention that complements building stability, building some of these partnerships or whatever, but it's not a CVE program because that's not a big problem for the most part. Last point, why do you go through all this? Because it's the key to good programming. You know, when I was based in the field, I used to work for something called Office of Transition Initiatives the best, the most successful programs where it was seamless, where it was our money and their actions and their ideas. And we had this partnership, so we were able to do that. Those were the best programs. Extremely hard to get to, but it's worth the effort.